He has given archival evidence that the charges, accusations against us were false and baseless. As political detainees, we know that all along. And therefore, we have always demanded an open trial so that everything can be brought up. However, as late as 2011, the government still stated the same accusations against us. Now, I think it's time for me to call uh, I mean, I would like to say that in order to maintain the, uh, uh, the uh, a sense of uh, a semblance of, uh, of uh, honesty and truthfulness, the current government should dissociate itself from the actions of the PAP in the past. Actions which were and are crimes against humanity. And I think we should also affirm the commitment to the United Nations Charter of Human Rights and to the process of democracy by, uh, by abolishing the Internal Security Act. Lastly, uh, I have another point here. Uh, lastly, I would like to re reaffirm or re the call made by Polgut Chinese for a commission of inquiry. And I think there's something more I'd like to add. And that is after Dr. Tham's speech, uh, I think the government should help uh, history teachers teaching local history because now you have a very big elephant, uh, Lord Ganesan, Indian deity for truth and education right in the center of the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and may I now invite Professor Michael Hall to share with us what you have to say. Well, um, <coughs> quite a lot of what I heard tonight is, was, is new to me. I must congratulate PJ for, for, for digging all this up. Um, and I think uh, it, so he's doing a lot of valuable work. But being a lawyer and an academic, I've been somehow responsible for what's going on. Um, <laughs> um, the people who are supposed to have set up this system. Uh, anyway, I'm not, I'm not a political scientist. I'm a lawyer and an academic. And um, uh, the good thing about Singapore is that um, it's not difficult to be an expert. There's so few of us. <laughs> and the moment we write one article, we become the expert. <laughs> That, that's how I acquired the title. Um, um, uh, I think BJ wanted me to say a word about the, the, the two regimes of detention without trial in Singapore. There are actually two laws which are, which are being used. One is the famous Internal Security Act, and I need to say nothing more about that. Um, there is a second one which is uh, less well known, although now it will be probably be more well known because of uh, the discussion in the, in the press recently. Um, it is called the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act. It is the longest temporary provision. <laughs> <laughs> um, it predates a lot of our permanent acts. Um, it needs to be renewed every five years, but it has been since 1959-16. Okay, so you, you, you divide the, the number of years by five years, and you get the number of times it has been renewed. Okay. Um, my concern as an academic about detention without trial yeah, is not the, the focus is not quite so much on, on, on this, but on um, the accountability of, of the power. Um, I am actually I'll tell you what, what 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 
am really an expert in, which is that is the criminal law. And um, how I came to be interested in, in detention without trial is because the whole idea that the government can detain you without trial makes a mockery of the whole of the criminal law. Because the idea of criminal law is that if you breach the criminal law, you are charged, you are tried, and then you are sentenced and detained. <coughs> this extraordinary power does away with all that. Right? So I began to look at it because it, you know, what's the point of me spending my life studying the criminal law when this, this <laughs> other power, which can be used to short circuit the whole thing here. So um, uh, that, that's how I, I, I came to, to, to study um, this. Right? Um, my own uh, generation, they thought, Mannheim's generations, yeah. um, uh, it was not quite cold storm, it was a bit too young here. Yeah. Uh, it was actually spectrum yeah, in, the, in the 80s. I think some of you are here, yeah, who are more qualified to speak about it than I was. Yeah. And very similar themes emerged. Very similar kinds of um, um, accusations, very similar kinds of uh, doubts about uh, whether or not they should have been detained. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think what, what I can best do is, I, 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 this afternoon I was, I, was, I was thinking about what to say. Yeah. Um, I came across, this, this must be an editorial in the Straits Times, yeah, of 15 November. 2013. Tough law still relevant. Uh, it doesn't have a, an attribution, so I assume it is an editorial in the Straits Times. And um, um, it's interesting how the, 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 the manner in which um, this kind of power is, 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 is publicly justified. Right? Um, um, it's, it, it is so. Uh, gosh, it's so unsatisfying. Okay, um, okay uh, just, just to, you should read it yourself again, right? Uh, but uh, I just, just pick out some of the, the strands of justification which which emerge from this uh, editorial. Um, it says, well, it starts off very well. The first paragraph says, yeah, you know, um, a law that, that permits this sort of power must be justified and it must be rigorously debated uh, and, and discussed, right? And then it goes on to try to justify why it should still exist. Uh, especially in the light of the detention of the four match fixers, the sort of people who are likely to destroy the country. <laughs> um, you know, when I, when I read about it, I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> match fixers. Uh, anyway, uh, so it, anyway, it goes on, yeah, right? So the first point we can pick up is uh, this line. Yeah. It, it goes on to say that, um, you know, in the, in the, in the 50s, there was law and disorder situation that was going, going on in Singapore, gangsters were running around, so we needed this power. Right? But now, it, the article says, um, things are much better, but it says, it is reasonable to argue that this happy state of affairs is itself a result of the deterrent capability of laws, including the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act. Right? So, we are enjoying the good law and order now, so says this trend of argument, because we have this act. And this, at the end, says Sean Power, the vote will be taken out, we're going to sink back into the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> so in what sense is it going to be temporary? Right? If the argument is that we need it in order to prevent it from slipping, from backsliding, then it would always be needed. There will never be a time when it will not be needed. Okay? So it doesn't work. Right? And it goes on. And um, it says, um, a few other things, but I, I just wanted to pick up this one here. Malaysia's experience is instructive, he says. Okay, what is this? The repeal of its emergency ordinance in 2011 was followed by such a spike in violent crime that it was found necessary to restore detention provisions in its laws. In 2011, Malaysia revoked its detention, but not entirely, just the, the, the one Malaysia has several detention laws like we do here, but he revoked one of them. And immediately there was, he said, a spike in the crime. And the police blame the absence of this law, and that's why they are reintroducing now. And that's why in Singapore we should we should follow the we should learn from the Malaysians. Right? Um, I don't know how much you know about Malaysia, I'm a Malaysian. And um, uh, uh, there are so when a criminologist look, looks at this, there's so much that's wrong about it. Is this a spike in violent crime? Where are the statistics here? 
what year are you comparing, what kind of crime. Okay, and, um, and how do we not know, how do we know or not know whether this spike in crime was engineered in order to create a situation where we would argue for the return of the potential loss. And to just transfer an experience from Malaysia over into Singapore just like that, yeah, it seems to be quite alarming. Yeah, because in no, in no other, in no other uh, context would the government of Singapore simply follow Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> And then it goes on, right? Um, the elaborate precautions taken against abuse to the administration of the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act should set hearts at rest. What are these elaborate provisions? Right? Um, we, we know that the, the legislation says that there has to be this committee. There is this committee which reveals the detentions. But we know nothing else. I'm not even sure whether the membership of these committees are public. It may be in some gazette somewhere. Okay, but how they function, uh, what they do, we don't know. But we can imagine. We can imagine. So we, we, we can ask questions like, does this supervisory body, which exists both for the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act and the Internal Security Act, there are different, different boards. Right? Um, now, they are probably uh, wise old men maybe a judge, maybe a senior accountant, maybe what it is. And they sit there and they receive a file given to them by the, by the um, uh, police in the case of the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act. In the case of the Internal Security uh, Act, it's by the Internal Security Department. So the file is completely constructed by that agency concerned, which has recommended detention. And when you read the file, what do you expect to see? Evidence against the rest? No, of course not. Yeah. Because um, they are. Let's put it this way. Yeah. Imagine, um, imagine that you are being tried for a crime, and the only person allowed to speak and to give evidence is the prosecutor. <laughs> so, what are these uh, uh, members of the advisory board going to do? What can they do? Do they have their own policemen to counter check the facts? No, they have to accept whatever documents come up to them. Okay, so, I'm afraid my heart is not at rest here. Um, and it goes on, the more regular release of detention statistics will help. It will help, but it doesn't tell us whether those detentions are justified. Right? And it says, in the final analysis, the very fact that the act is temporary, <laughs> <laughs> being dependent on parliamentary re renewal every five years, is a safeguard of the highest order. <laughs> <laughs> Parliamentary scrutiny obliges the authorities to show why they are justified in using a powerful law instead of becoming dependent on it out of habit. Whoever wrote this, I think, is well aware of the issues at hand. Right? But indeed, how do we know? How can we know whether or not it is being used in justified circumstances or just out of habit when it is not necessary to do so. In what way does the, the, the parliamentary scrutiny every five years help you? Okay, um, what of our four match fixes? And what earthly justification can it be said that the normal processes of the criminal law cannot be used against them? If the normal processes of the criminal law cannot handle something like four match fixes, <laughs> I think I should change my specialization in become a commercial lawyer instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I can just make a quick historical comment, actually, it's, it's very interesting to think of temporary, uh, the, the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act you know, in its current uh, context, but it was introduced in 1955 by the David Marshall government, actually. Uh, because David Marshall campaigned specifically